Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adam Borzoni, and I welcome you to Danny Boy, the British Music Hall Society's tribute to the life and career of Danny LaRue. Daniel Patrick Carroll was born on July the 26th, 1927, in Cork. His family moved to Soho when he was six to a flat from where he could see the Palace Theatre. After leaving school at 15, he worked as a baker's assistant, lift operator, and window dresser. At 18, he joined the Royal Navy and Ship's Concert Party. So I'm laughing because I can hear all <laughs> <laughs> He tried herding there as well. <laughs> His first part uh, in the uh, Ship's Concert Party was as a native girl in white cargo. In 1947, he was demobbed and returned to London and back to his job as a window dresser. He auditioned for Forces Showboat, an all-male review, admitting, I can't do anything but look good and move well. <laughs> Nonetheless, he was immediately offered a job in the chorus, and during his time in Forces Showboat, he met Jack Hansen, who became his companion and manager. He appeared in Forces in petticoats, soldiers in skirts, but felt that he wasn't making much progress, and so he returned to window dressing. In 1954, he was contacted by Ted Gatti, with whom he had previously worked. Gatti needed some extra chorus girls for a show that he was staging at the Irving Theatre near Leicester Square. Not wanting to lose his day job, Danny agreed on one condition that his involvement must be kept a secret. And so Gatti billed him as Danny Leroux, saying that he wanted a bit of French sophistication. And when Danny was all dressed up with his feathers, he was as long as a street. <laughs> Danny Leroux was born and became a sensation. And shortly after, he was offered the star spot at uh, Churchill's Club in Mayfair. With his dazzling, extravagant costumes, immaculate makeup, glorious wigs and high heels, Danny LaRue enjoyed a long and glittering career, and was once described by Noel Coward as the most professional, the most witty, and the most utterly charming man in the business. It's ten years since Danny has passed away, and it is a measure of his love that still endures for him that all the tickets for tonight sold out within minutes. And so many of his friends and colleagues offered to be part of tonight. First of all, I'm going to introduce you to the wonderful people that will be chatting in the second half of tonight's show. So please, to talk about working with Danny in pantomime and musical theatre, please welcome Keith Simmons and Lorna Dallas. <laughs> to talk about Danny's costumes and wigs, and also the very personal side of Danny, please welcome Annie Galbraith and Stephen Metcalf. Oh. Working with Dallas at the Palace, with Danny at the Palace Theatre, and a friendship that has lasted over 40 years. Please welcome the President of the British Musical Society, Mr. Roy Hart Oli. Thank you. So we'll enjoy talking to them all in the, the second half, but thank you very much for coming. As previously mentioned, Danny famously worked at Churchill's before opening his own club in Hanover Square in 1964. I'm utterly delighted to bring on five people that worked with him all over those club years. Please give a very warm welcome to Valerie Walsh.
Jenny Logan. And Alyssa Newcomb. I'm a member of the hip hop generation. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be Julie Logan. <laughs> 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 so, that's good. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a tiny bit more script, then it's over to you five for an hour, and I won't speak. I've only got one. Uh, bit of training to interview people, and that was Bella Enberg. And for those of you that saw that, <laughs> it's quite interesting. So, so where do we start? Barry, let's start with you. You were writing with Ted Dix for a show at the Fortune Theatre, and another thing, with Bernard uh, Cribbins, yeah. Anton Rogers, Joyce and Lionel Blair, yes. and you got a phone call to, ring, or to go to Danny's uh, show at Win uh, Winston's, yes? Danny had seen, uh, I think, the review. I think Anna Quayle, I remember, the actress who was a mate, she did a couple of, excuse me, sketches I wrote. And Dan saw them and said, who wrote this? And one thing led to another, and Ted Dixon and I were invited by Dan to do a nightclub show for him. <coughs> Brian Blackburn was our precursor who wrote his shows. Got to give credit there. And, uh, yes. Turned out a fallout over a bouncing check with uh, Bruce Bray, so <laughs> I, I stayed on with Dan for about, what, 13 years or something. It was a joy, and this gang know what it was like. I got my old Olivetti typewriter in the dressing room, still writing the show while you were rehearsing it. Oh, was it? Oh, and I used to do six copies with carbon paper. And Dan would get the top copy, and you would all get it. George Giles, who was in the show, oh, yeah. George got the last copy, which is so favourite. He could hardly read it. And George said to Dan, Dan, could you read that? He said, darling, I don't have to. <laughs> Can I get it over with now? I've written a short poem about Dan. Yeah. I wrote it while waiting for a laugh in Lowestoft. <laughs> Is he laughing? <laughs> okay. We're here to celebrate Danny LaRue, a one-off nightclub legend who was born in Soho as Daniel Patrick Carroll. So we all gather here to roll out the barrel for him. The memories of his nightclub in Hanover Square and before that Winston's and that was there. I met on the same day my wife and Ronnie Corbett and I began to spin in the orbit. <laughs> Surrounding Danny, we were this happy gang who danced and laughed and joked and sang, and Dan was our employer, our mentor. There was no one who could present a show like him. <laughs> AM, 1.15 AM, wasn't it? And the stars who came, I remember them. Noel Coward, Judy Garland, and many more. You never knew when you took the floor who was watching, who just might be there. I was heckled by John Lennon one night. <laughs> and now I'm thinking, what rhymes with Danny? The answer is obvious, our dear Annie. <laughs> Danny's rock and carer. She is here tonight with us all to share a memory or two. <laughs> Shut up, you. I now retire. No, I'm not saying that to myself. I now retire. She also all I love you. What was his name again? Oh, yes. Barry Cry. Thank you. <laughs> Barry, 
how, how different was the material that you wrote for Danny and the reviews to any previous stuff that you'd done before? Uh, you could do sheer filth. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no swearing. Dan wouldn't have swearing, would he? None of that. It was all double entendre and uh, everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was rather different. And uh, I read that Dennis Norton said to you that he never knew that there were so many cock jokes in the world. <laughs> 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 no, it's a different world, you've got a different uh, discipline. But as I said, Dan would not have any uh, swearing, but you have to do... Um, we wrote a character for him, uh, Lady Cynthia Grope. <laughs> <laughs> it was a precursor of Margaret Thatcher, actually. <laughs> and either Doug Fisher or I, or whoever would be interviewing Dan, and, uh, you know, we'd say uh, to Lady Cynthia, what do you think of Michael Foote? A wild exaggeration. <laughs> and these great days, I mean, I wrote these lines and I think I, or whoever was interviewing Dan, said, uh, let's talk about Edward Heath. And Dan said, and people do, you know. <laughs> And what about Danny remembering and learning his lines? <laughs> ask them about that. <laughs> ask to no, ask Tony about that. Yeah, ask Tony about that. He never remembered a word. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I was there for. I just in the next room and thought, oh, for God's sake, now what's he going to say? Can I remember this? No, I can't. Yes, I can remember this. But it didn't make it. Scrap of difference because whatever I said, nobody laughed. Whatever he said, they did. <laughs> Tony knows this. Uh, you and uh, Ronnie Corbett, and you, you could get a bruised arm. Oh, yeah. Because if Dan didn't I've remember the next line, you got hold of your arm. <laughs> to this day, if you get hold of your hand, if you got nervous and he bend it back like that, oh my god. Oh, the memories, look at your finger now. <laughs> <laughs> you told me not to ask you particularly years, because well, no one cares unless you said. I was some weird nightclub called Rico Dargeau. Does anybody know that? Yeah. Yeah. And I asked, do you remember Rico Dargeau? We know. It was terrible as anyway. I got this call one day, and they said, oh, this guy called Danny in the room would like to see you. And I was working at Stratford in are we all right with no mic, or do you want the mic? Oh, yeah. Get on the mic. I was working, I hate mic. <laughs> I was working at Stratford East, and I got Victor Spinetti came with Barbara Windsor and all that lot. Oh. And Bar and Dan, um, 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 Victor came, Victor Spinetti, mm. I'm sure you all remember, and said, um, Oh, this guy, Danny, wants to see you. So I said, Oh, well, I'll go and see him. So I went to see Danny, and he said, Oh, it was Winston's, wasn't it? Winston's. Yes. He said, I said, do you want to be in the show? And I said, what show? He said, well, Winston's show. And I said, what goes on there? And he said, it's a sort of a nightclub. It's a great fun and everything. And I thought, well, that sounds all right. So I said, yes, and there I was. <laughs> I, can't really, I can't really say any more than that, because that was literally how it happened. And how many years were you stood next to Dan? 21. <laughs> <laughs> Is that um, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I met Dan, uh, 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 formally, I met Dan properly the very first day of a rehearsal. Uh, the very same day I met my wife and Ronnie Corbett, the same day, uh, tossed a coin and married her. <laughs> Ronnie loved that, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, Ronnie married Dan. He did, he did. That was the same, so we all, yeah, we all got Andy. married to each other. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed to work out quite well. <laughs> oh, love to Annie Hart tonight, oh, I think. Oh, God bless her, Definitely, yes. 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 And, and over the, oh, so over those years, there, there were many, many sketches. Any that really stick out in your mind? I've got uh, written down here that you played Mandy Rice Pudding. That's <laughs> right. In a, in a Christine Keeler's yes. hair. Have you heard of Christine Keeler? She's the and all that. And then it was Mandy Rice Pudding. No, stop, stop. We, 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 we wouldn't get away with that. 
get away with it now. Now, would Mandy Rice Davis and Christine Keeler turned up to watch it one oh, night yeah. with Lucky Gordon. Anybody with the memories of these people? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they saw us doing all this. I think, yeah. uh, wittily, she was called Pristine Peeler, I think. <laughs> Pudding. Pudding. And, uh, they said one night they're in. I don't know who I played. I'm... <laughs> Were you Christine Peeler? Who was Danny playing then? Danny was playing Christine. Christine Peeler. Peeler. Dan was playing Christine, the lead, I have to say. <laughs> But we heard they were out front, and funny enough, they never came round after the show. <laughs> <laughs> and Clarissa, when, when, did, when did you first meet Danny? I can't be quite tell you. I can't remember. It was always there. I can't remember when... He wasn't there. <laughs> no, I can't. It's, it is. So you don't remember going to any official audition or no, seeing no, him? No, seeing no, him. Oh, we we never had an audition. audition. Yeah. Did he see you in a show? Or? No. They're done. They're <laughs> <laughs> done. I found myself there. And I, I have no, I cannot remember that. I will when I'm asleep tonight. I'll wake up, sit up in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep asking. Jenny, do yes, you have any idea? <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Um, I, I actually. I do have a. Jenny uh, sensible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's younger um, than <laughs> I met Danny in Manchester, and I was a Dennis Egan dancer. Dennis Egan had a troupe of Dennis Egan dancer. And, um, and we met and got on. And then when I came into London, I was in How to Succeed in Business uh, at the Shaftesbury. And uh, they wanted, and I heard via the internal grapevine that they wanted uh, some more, that they wanted two dancers. So, yeah, some were all singers or whatever. And I went along, and Danny remembered me. And, and the rest, as they say, is, you know, that was it, really. Yes, you are going to say something, Joseph? No? Me? No? I'm just annoyed because I can't remember. <laughs> 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 Valerie, can you remember? Yes, I remember. 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 Yes, I would you like to come and work at Winston's? And that, was, like that was in the Shaftesbury, with Dora Bryan. That's right. We started off at the Shaftesbury and then moved to the Strand. And um, he came round and I said yes. And uh, that led to many years. Jack, Jack came round, didn't he? Not, not Danny. Didn't no, he? I think it was well, Danny who came to see the show. Yeah. Um, and Jack was with him, probably. You have to say who Jack was for people here, don't you? I, yeah, I, I briefly said that uh, he met... Uh, oh, you briefed the audience. Briefed the audience. We did yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah, we, 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 we had a good rehearsal. We were in the corridor. <laughs> we were in the bloody corridor. Exactly. Right. Well, do you remember when we all left to join Danny, I mean, to go to Danny's yeah. job, and we all went to Bruce Brace, and, I mean, those days you got paid your money in an envelope when you queued up, and they took the money for your national health stamp <coughs> and they stuck a stamp on every week proving that you paid it. And we all left and went to Bruce and asked for our cards and he didn't have them. And he'd taken all of our money and not stuck any other stamps on And we, we spent months with the government, didn't we? To yes, I that we paid all yeah. our money. I don't remember any of it. <laughs> Do you remember being in uh, Come Spy With Me? <laughs> 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 you were in the film, Marcia. 
she was in the film version. You were in the film version and you were in the stage version. No, I, no. Was, I was the only I was the only one who was not asked to be in Tom's Spy. <laughs> oh. I wasn't in Tom's Spy, did I? <laughs> I wasn't asked to be in Tom's Spy. <laughs> Carl Windsor and and, and 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 June Hunt, who then became Jan, 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 who then became, but at the time she was called June Hunt and changed her name after to Jan Hunt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, saw, I saw a program last week and it says June Hunt and it's, it's, it's Jan Hunt. Fun spy Oh, yes, she took over from Barbara. Yes, yes, yes. 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 And, and the White Hole. And the White Hole. We've had Boris mention the name Hunt. Where's it going to? <laughs> <laughs> so that as a fairness, we've mentioned Boris, we have to mention Hunt. And it's out of Tony, I read that you said that Danny was very grand and very. Uh, and, and there was no reason to be humble because there's absolutely no point. Is that something that Danny said, or that Are you... you asking me? Yes. <laughs> yes, he did, actually. I do remember him saying that. It's no, no point being humble, darling. It doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> Just be proud and shout and do what you like, and everything will be fine. Never be humble. Humble pie does not work. <laughs> oh, we're back to Boris again. <laughs> Oh, that's right, yes. Mrs. just said, he said, I'm not a star, I'm a legend. <laughs> in my own lifetime. A legend in my own lifetime. I was talking earlier, uh, after the show one night, Dan was a really good host and everything, and we sat with a woman who just loved the show and everything, and she said, oh, Danny, do you enjoy dressing up as a lady? He said, no, dear, do you? <laughs> I, I read the Danny down there, Barry, that you said that, that it was just as bawdy backstage as well. And what about some of the guests that came backstage? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Go on. Well, I like Chloe, I can't remember them all, but I mean, <laughs> Princess Margaret and her lot came. And then uh, a lot of the American stars came. Betty Grable, I was doing a musical with Betty Grable, and she came, she'd heard about Danny, and she said, oh, I, you know, I'd really like to see Bell Star? That's right. Bell Star. So she came in, and Barbara Windsor was there that night, so I introduced the two of them, and Barbara thought, like I did, I mean, she was one of our goddesses, Betty yeah. Grable, when we were young. And, uh, Yes, she came in. Judy Garland came in, which I told you. <laughs> no, go on, yeah, to tell them what you did to Judy yes, Garland. Judy Garland came in, loved the show, came into the dressing room afterwards, and I was cutting my fringe, as usual, and she said, oh, God, I need my fringe cut. Will you cut my fringe off? So I cut Judy Garland. Noel Coward as well. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Carl. Noel Coward came more than once. And, uh, I used to <laughs> Noel said Noel was buttonholed by a man in the club one night. The guy had had a few. He was well pissed. He said, Noel Coward, I passed your house last night. Noel Coward said, thank you. <laughs> Dressing room, and it was bisexual dressing room, wasn't it? Dan had his phone box star dressing room, and we were all crammed in. And we were doing a corridor. And, we and Noel Coward finale with Bill, Bill Solomon in a brilliant arrangement. And the great man comes in, you're doing a Noel Coward finale, for heaven's sake. So you know, his marvellous cigarette. And it was brilliant. And then he came and he stayed quite a while. He was very warm and a killer when he got to know him, you know, and all that sitting on the table, I remember, sort of down his legs. And then I had a terrible thought, you did it with Dan. I ripped off a, a tune of Noel Coward. I got away with it in a club, not in the theatre. And he did a show called Ace of Clubs. And there was a song called, uh, we're two juvenile delinquents, juvenile delinquents, da 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 And I ripped it off and wrote for you. 
with two most successful call girls. We were the toast of all girls. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh boy. And Noel Cowell had a tape recorder in his head and he, he praised the finale, which is good, and I mentioned Bill's name. And then he said, who wrote the uh, opening song? I was like, oh God, I said, uh, sorry, it was me. And he patted me on the head and said, nearly as good as mine. <laughs> You, you, you mentioned Jack, and I, I also uh, saw you being interviewed, Barry, and you said that it was a horrible period for being gay. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. people were persecuted. And I sp spoke to you, Valerie, about yeah. that lots of your family came and loved, loved yes. Danny. Oh, yeah. I and mean, all the aunties, my auntie Joan, my auntie Phil, and they used to say, you know, he's so lovely, aren't he? And but I would write for Danny in that idiom and you look back you think bless his heart he would come on looking sensational and his opening line was usually watch your mates <laughs> <laughs> so the men could relax think it's a joke he's all dressed up the women could admire the frocks and everything but of course your gay mates had come up they'd probably been ruined and gone to prison for once, the women got the better part of the law because the gay women weren't covered by the law at the time. Yeah. But it was, it was a horrible era, oh, an era full of hypocrisy. Do you know where that watch you made came from? Um, well, no, I don't know the origin of that, no. No, I don't either, but I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, Dan, <laughs> I tried all the ones that you don't know. <laughs> Dan used to wear his superb tight-fitting costume and he used to look at the front row sometimes and say, I know what you're thinking. Yeah. Where does Where he put, put it? <laughs> <laughs> Darling, I whistle and it goes away by itself. <laughs> That's it. So we've got plenty of time to ask any questions from the audience as well. Anyone got any questions for anyone? Are they rude? <laughs> Lionel Bart. Oh, Lionel came and I was doing it again. He'd done a show called Blitz and there was a song, Who's This Geezer Hitler? And uh, I ripped Lionel off. And I uh, we were doing Anthony and Cleopatra. Oh, you me? Yes. <laughs> Anthony and Cleopatra. And I wrote this song, Who's This Geezer Caesar? Caesar. <laughs> and I get tipped off one night. Lionel's in. I thought, oh, God. And after the show, I go, tentatively into the darkness of the club. Lionel Bart came up to me. Hello, pal. He said, who's this Gita Caesar? Better than mine, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, Barry. Um, Barry, you've been amazing had a degree in Russian. He, he had been at Roxford and, and that was his degree. And he <laughs> came into his own because he went out and did the whole introduction in Russian. Uh -huh. It was a really, really special yeah. And Nuriev was, was laughing. Yeah. Uh, and they were laughing at Nuriev laughing. <laughs> and then Ronnie Corbett came on and Dan and everything. And then the audience are laughing, but the man next to Nuriev was going, <laughs> explaining the joke that had just gone. So I was getting about three laughs for every joke. <laughs> now, it, um, Danny created this great family. Uh, but as you, you, you said earlier, that the shows didn't start till 1, in, 1 in 15 in the, in the morning. Yeah. Usually 1.30. 1.30. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> and, and you were all in other shows. Yes. Oh, I mean, everyone was doing musicals or bits of television. Yes. And, and I mean, the worst time, because we literally had four hours of sleep time. Do you remember when we did Come Spy With Me on tour? Yes. And Danny kept the club open. And we were on tour, we went to places like Oxford, and we do uh, eight shows a week, two matinees. As soon as the show was finished in Oxford, we'd get on in the car, drive up to town, do the cabaret with Dan, 
go home, have four hours sleep, drive down to Oxford in the next morning and do two shows, and again back to, I mean... Yeah, I did that. Yeah, 1966, you did Oxford, Brighton, and then Golders Green. That's oh, you, that's right. Before you, came into, Gosh, before you came into the Whitehall. That's right. Far. <laughs> but I mean, it was all so enjoyable, and we were just sitting yeah. downstairs. I mean, we had such we great fun, and we never felt we were so lucky love. to be doing something we love all of our lives, yeah. and something we chose to do, and it was always, always fun. And I was lucky, I was close by, I was being chairman at the Players Music Hall oh, yeah. at Charing Cross, and uh, I'd do that, and then... Uh, I'd walk, I'd walk probably to the club in a leisurely fashion. I was a lucky one. Then you have to take that pancake off your face and put some. Oh, by the way, Terry, my darling, and I in early days used to go to work on bikes. And you'd chain them up behind the club. And uh, she has the ladies' bike with no crossbar, right? And my bike, my bike was stolen one night. And it'd been broken into and stolen. And uh, there was Terry's bike, and dear Terry was about going to have our first son, Tony, so she wasn't in the show. So I thought, we've still got a bike in the family. So I had this lady's bicycle, and one night at the club, I thought, I'm not cleaning this stuff off. We were in Made Avail by then. I thought, I'll go home and wash off. You're riding a woman's bicycle <laughs> up Edgware Road, wearing full makeup. <laughs> And there was a copper there, it was obviously all stiff. And I got to red lights, here, you! And he called me in. And I thought, oh, God, where do you get that bike? So I started telling the story. The lights are going amber green, amber green, red. I want to go home. He finally got very interested. I thought, I'm never going to get home. He said, oh, Winston, that's Danny DeRue, isn't it? And all that. Sorry, I'll shut up now. <laughs> There was a nice one when we went to Coventry. We were doing that trip up and down, up and down. So we went to Coventry, Hippodrome. This was our first date. So we walked into this theatre, which was a wreck. And Danny walked in and he said, Oh, yes, thank you very much. Where's my dressing room? So that's your dressing room. So Danny said, Yes, well, where's my reception room? <laughs> and where do I keep all my costumes and my wigs? And then he said, and where's Miss Palmer's dressing room? Well, we opened the door and it was like a rat hole. I mean, it was so awful. And, and Mr. Ellen's dressing room? Danny said, fine. We are now going to our, well, we're going to have dinner. And we will come back. And when it is carpeted, painted, with lights round the mirror, and this and that and the other, we will come back. And if we like it, we'll stay. And if we don't, we should go back to London. <laughs> 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 we David and I were standing there going, yeah. We got the car, we went, you know, we came back at half past five and it was done. Oh. <laughs> Carpets, painted, everything. Things to hand the costumes out. And ever since, people who've played Coventry have said, Oh my God, thank God for Dan. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom of our road, Harrow Arts Centre, which is still going strong, but it's basically a concert hall. And Dan arrived to do something, and he looked, and the whole setup is interesting. The stage and the lighting and everything. He said, No, no, this is all wrong. Um, I've got to take my dog for a walk now. He said, and if I come back and nothing's changed, I'm going to be ill. <laughs> <laughs> and they sorted it all for him. He was a one off And it worked. It worked. It's actually were... loyal to us lot. We were his oh. gang. Yes. You had to go at any of us. Oh, Dan was there for you. We did a tribute to, to him much later on, and he was in the audience. We all turned up. And I said, we're all here today for you, Dan, because you were always there for us. That's right. He was very good he for us. He was very good. He did look after us, didn't he? Yeah. Really. We didn't get a lot of money, but he <laughs> <laughs> well, If I tell you what we earned, you perhaps won't believe it, but I don't know about you lot, but I, the whole time I was in that club, I earned £50 a week. Oh, oh, oh yes. <laughs> Well, we did 
get. It was a magnum of champagne every Christmas oh, yes. to take home to our families. Oh, yes. Christmas. We got all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't there for over 50,000. And when you asked him, if you ever, I did ask him for a, a, a rise once, and he said, oh, darling, I haven't got it coming in. <laughs> The place was packed every night. Fifty a week. <laughs> when I got the magnum of champagne, I used to take it home and sell it. Things can only get bitter. So, so we've spoken about Danny created this family, this wonderful atmosphere. He really, really looked after you. But what I was going on to was that you were in all these other shows, and, and if you wanted. You went to Broadway with Oh, What a Lovely War, and, but he didn't particularly like you leaving. No, no, no. Oh, no. Very, he was very, very possessive about yeah, all of like us. And uh, he didn't think we should leave at all. And when I wanted to go to Broadway to do Lovely War, he said, America, you won't like America. New York here, it's really dangerous. You won't enjoy it, you won't enjoy it. And then later on, a few years later, I wanted to go to Japan to do um, Oliver, Nancy and Oliver. And I said, Dan, you know, um, I want to go. I've been offered uh, Nancy and Oliver. And I'd really like to go to Tokyo. Japan? You said you can't go to Japan. Look what they did to us in the war. <laughs> You'll never survive it. <laughs> anyway, as soon as I came back, you know, he must be back again, like all of us, if we have to do anything, come straight back again. And another thing I just thought of, of course, all of us worked for Joan Littlewood, and it was so easy working for Joan Littlewood that most people found really difficult because they had to think literally, literally, of a minute. And um, she just thought, it was really good that we well, could all we do all that. that. We've been doing it. Joan Littlewood thought that we were the best actors yeah. in the whole world, <laughs> all of us. Yeah. And she, she was just so, she came to see the show and she said, yeah. I don't want anyone around me but these people. We all got jobs there. Yeah. Yeah. Terry was in pantomime, weren't yeah. you? Yes. Down right. and he asked you yeah. what you were doing after pantomime, yeah? yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was extraordinary, but... The funny thing about, you know, Melding Joan, who was the most modernist in her day kind of person, and Danny was considered to be, you know, some old drag thing, and she thought it was absolutely wonderful. And she thought we were all wonderful. We all got jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Danny hated the word drag, didn't he? I didn't no, he never, used it. He never used it. Never used it, no. no. Yeah, so I've got, I've got a few things that he, he wants to be called either a man in a frog. Yes. Or a female impersonator, but, but never a drag. Never oh, a drag. No, 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 drag is a horrid word. And at the end of the show, always appeared as himself. Yes. Oh. Oh, yes. At the club, he did. Yes. Very quick always. change. He was determined to call us himself. I think the off. record was two and a half minutes. How he did that, I'll never know. Annie knows. Annie knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could all tell you, he had a great big tube, a thing of crow's cremine. Anybody yeah. know what that is? So that got slapped on like that, a great big towel which was wet, and he went like that. And I tell you this to this day, that will get the whole lot off in my half second. He had a dress about him, didn't he? Yes, he, oh, yes, he had. Yes, he oh, did. Oh, yes, yes, I forgot. I forgot her name. No, yes, no well, no. What well, was man? Here we go. <laughs> he, always, he always had somebody to help him, but it did literally take two minutes to get all that on. Yeah. He just put his suit on. You're and watching this week's edition of Memory Loss. <laughs> 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 Clarissa, Clarissa, what did you just say? I was engaged to him for one night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one night I had to be his fiance. Who was it who came in? American film star. Oh God, oh God, he was in, oh God, he was praying Roman things. Not Charlton. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, I just sat there, didn't have a ring, I complained bitterly. How <laughs> <laughs> weird, I didn't know that. Oh. 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 Did you get up to when I wasn't around? <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't on 50 quid, so. <laughs> no, no. First you get told he's 50 quid, now you're engagement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to off in a minute. <laughs>
So the club was in Hanover Square, which I've, I've, <laughs> I've uh, read uh, is, uh, it was just behind Woolworths on Oxford Street. Oh one? yes, and Ronnie yes. Corbett's mum and dad came one night. And the location, you know, Hanover Square, very smart, top right hand corner. But its also location really was behind it, was Woolworths in Oxford Street. <laughs> and Ronnie Corbett's mum and dad uh, came to see the show one night. And Dan, typically marvellous host, sat them down with some champagne afterwards, and I was there. Ronnie Corbett's father looked round the Winston's club. You're wasting your time here, son. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan took it very well, but you know, this club which has been sensationally successful in Hanover Square. But Dan used to tell that later on to people. You're wasting your time here, son. Wasn't it? Jenny, if you were to describe the atmosphere in that club, how would you describe it? Just fun. I mean, it was really just fun. And, and everybody that came, they came to see the show. And the chef. And the chef. Well, the chef. Oh, yeah. You can watch it work. Come and see if you like his food. Then he come out with you. Oh, steak tata. Somebody's just ordered that well done. <laughs> Waiters so have come. Well, Waiters have come past you while you were changing, and also <laughs> going to the well, fish to safe to get some fish. Out. <laughs> 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 That's what we were in. It was a fire exit. God knows what would happen if you'd been in a bar. There was a one outside the restaurant. Bloody fire exit. Yeah. Well, well, that was that was really good. Was at Winston's. I mean, all the noise that went on, the waiters, the call girls, everything going on. But when we got to Dan's, he was marvellous. He said, no waiters, no clacking of plates, no ordering, was no speaking. And it was, yeah. we just did a review as in a theatre. Yeah. Quiet and everybody listened. It was wonderful. Shut up. Yeah. Winston's was terrible. Do you remember that when they put the fruit machine down the end? Of <laughs> <laughs> we put the fruit machine right down. It's a long Club. They put this fruit machine, and we we're all there going, nah, nah, you nah, nah. And so Danny said to Bruce Brave, if you dare let anybody play that fruit machine in the show, you've had it. So we we're all going, tra la la, I think we got to the finale, Barbara was twitting around, and suddenly there was this crashing noise of all these coins. <laughs> and Danny left the stage. I mean, it was only about this size. He went down the steps, down the end, and I heard him go, I told you, if you dare ever use that trick, and we we're all going, ah! <laughs> Topical stuff uh, <laughs> at the time, Field Marshal uh, Montgomery, you know, the legendary Montgomery. I can't remember why. I was playing Montgomery <laughs> on the stage, and a table went over, and a sort of war veteran came at me, shouting out, This is an insult to the great man, this is an insult. And Dan, halfway through a change, reappeared on the little stage on my behalf and pointed at the man and said, Be quiet! Where would you join the war? <laughs> and the man retreated and was pulled off by waiters. And I said, I was at school. <laughs> oh, he acted for you, you know, he'd come on and support you if you're having a bad time. Support him in turn. Oh, <laughs> he was, he was fun. And we were family. I mean, it was family. Actually. It was so we, we briefly mentioned him earlier, but what was Jack like? Uh, oh, no. <coughs> a rock. And how important was Jack? Completely was supported. A rock. He was oh, he's the absolute rock. rock. Dan's rock, so yes, rock. definitely. In fact, when, when Jack sadly died, that's, you know, when Danny sort of went to pieces a bit, he was. Jack was just knew how to and treat him and handle him and calm him down and an amazing person. Such a nice man, really. We all love Jack. Yeah. Didn't we? yeah, yeah. And of course Dan was um, insecure, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Because I mean he never stopped saying, did he? Right up to the I look good in this, don't I look good? Yeah. Doesn't the wig, does the wig look good? And this colour suits me, doesn't it? I mean, do the legs look good? Do they? Um, I mean, you'd think he'd be so secure by the end. And he never was, and that never stopped. Never, never stopped, no. 
But, and then he used to say, if you did something and he, Danny didn't like it, he wouldn't really tell you. He'd get Jack to tell you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt very apologetically and say, you know when you say that night, I won't tell you what it was because it was pretty filthy actually. <laughs> and Jack used to say, I think you're putting a bit, little bit too much emphasis on that. <laughs> and if you could just calm that down, it was so sweet, you know. He would never tell you what to do, but he always knew if, if something you were doing wasn't quite right, and, and he would send Jack to tell you. Yeah. Poor old Jack. He said to once, dear Jack, he said later on, he said, I thought. Dear Jack's going to finish up in a wheelchair. It didn't happen like this, but he's going to finish up in a wheelchair, like a vegetable. God bless him. He said, and you know, I think I'd have wanted to push him off beachy head, and I think Jack would have understood. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Like this image of dear Jack going have a beachy head. In a Dan, I do understand. <laughs> I, I briefly showed uh, these earlier. I, I put this picture on, on Facebook uh, th this week and asked people to name these four people. I, I, I'll leave them uh, at the front of the stage uh, when we finish so you can come and have a look. And everyone named Danny uh, here. A few people named you Tony. A few people named you Valerie. But not one person <laughs> named Barry Cryer. Just <laughs> who's just there. <that. laughs> Well, one person did, but they cheated, didn't they? I'm not looking at anyone, Jenny. <laughs> 50 pounds, she was engaged to him. No, you back no. <laughs> and, and this one, oh Barry, my God. You, you and a toga, Barry. Yes. With uh, Danny, uh, Tony, Barry, uh, Valerie, and I don't know who this is, who's that? Mike oh. Billington. Mike Billington. Billington. Mike Billington. Jumble. 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 Yes, it is. <laughs> Jumble, why was he called Jumble? Because he was in a heap at the end of the car. <laughs> 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 And he, he just was, and he drove Jenny mad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the fire exit. I mean, she he, he drove Jenny to drink. To <laughs> drink. The jungle, didn't he? He drove you to drink. <laughs> and I was dressed in a toga. I didn't need much driving. <laughs> I was dressed in a toga, but I'm dyslexic. I thought they wanted me to be dressed as a goat. <laughs> I've got, the, I've got the opening programmes of uh, Danny, opening uh, March, uh, March the 9th, uh, which... Uh, say which year then? I can't remember. And, and, and this is the, 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 the Winston's uh, programme as well, so I'll, I'll leave the, these uh, at the front of the stage. We lich, unfortunately, time has flown by, so any other questions? I'll, I'll take anecdotes in the second half as well, if anyone's got any anecdotes of, of you working. Uh, the audience members with, with Danny or whatever. But any other questions for the these back. wonderful at five? At the back. At the back, yes. Shout out. Uh, I was just wondering what it was like when the uh, when the club closed. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> when, when the club closed. Nineteen seventy three was it? Nineteen seventy three? Three. Three. Yeah. Three. yeah. Very sad. I was lucky, I think. I was working in telly writing. I think I was the lucky one, but no, I'm, I'm just in telly. Well, I think we were all working here, right? We just yeah, but it's it. end of an era, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, and you all stayed in contact with, 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 with Danny over the years? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to dear Annie as well. Yeah. Keep yeah. in touch. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, Barry, I've got written here that you said that in his later years that you felt that he became very wistful. Yes. That's it, really. I can't turn <laughs> <laughs> an arch on that. You went through all that. He's full of wist. <laughs> no, he would, in a way that he never did when you were with him at his peak and working with him. Dan, you chatted later on, I don't know whether Danny would agree, but. He becomes sort of quite quiet and, you know, remembering things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you all have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you again? <laughs> Any final questions for these? 
Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Barry, Tony, Valerie, Clarissa, and Jenny. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back to this Danny Boy a celebration of the life and career of Danny LaRue. Now, we briefly met them in the first half, but let's welcome them back on stage for our second half. Please welcome, first up, Annie Kelbright. closed on the 18th of March 1972. Danny LaRue at the Palace opened in 1971 at the Palace Theatre, the very theatre that Danny could see from his childhood flat, and the theatre that he said to his mother, one day my name will be up in lights there. The show ran for two years, grossing one and a half million pounds. Now... <laughs> <laughs> the pantomime season of 1969-1970, a certain young Mr. Roy Hudd was at the Wimbledon Theatre with Arthur Askey in Sleeping Beauty. And one morning, your agent, Morris, rang you. Yes, you did. Uh, yes. Um, you were, I remember that playing Sleeping, very well. You were playing Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. You? <laughs> no, it was funny that because Arthur Asker, people always say in our game about people are so vicious and always trying to get on top and all that sort of stuff. I've never found that, particularly with them. And uh, if you know what I mean. And, uh, Barry, Barry wrote that one, didn't you, Barry? <laughs> Well, um, what, uh, what actually happened was that uh, I had had the worst year of my life. I, I was in a, the first series I was doing for ITV on my own, that flopped, right? The second one, my first radio series, that flopped. And then I was in a play in the West End at the Garrick Theatre that ran for six nights. <laughs> <laughs> Written by Angelico, wrote the knack, and Rita Tushingman was my girlfriend in it. And my mum was Dandy Nichols. <laughs> six nights it ran, and that was it. So I was in a very good mood then, you can imagine. I couldn't get arrested, I couldn't. My agent couldn't even get me a, a Sunday concert, it was terrible. And the pal of mine was Arthur Askey's daughter. Anthea, you know. And I said to Anthea, oh, I'm having a terrible time. I was out of work for nine months, the longest I've ever not earned any money. Nine months, you know. So she was talking to her dad, you see, and saying, oh, he's had a hard time, but it's a shame and all that. And he said, oh, really? And they rang Arthur and said, would you be interested in doing pantomime at Wimbledon? And Arthur said, yes, I would. He said, but I'll tell you something. He said, I must have Roy Hutt in it, he said, we're marvellous together in pantomime. I've never even met him. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we got together down there and it, business was so bad, even my agent Morris, he, he didn't even bother to come on the opening night. You know? And he said, did anyone come round the next day? I said, yeah, this bloke come round. I said, uh, I said oh, you know, I don't know what, a female impersonator, he said he was. Now he'd come round, it was of course Danny, and Danny had come round to see our dame, who was Alan Haynes. Oh. Yeah, you all remember Alan. Oh, Him yeah. and Danny were ugly sisters together in Pantomime. Can you imagine Danny being an ugly sister? <laughs> they never looked at Cinderella once he'd been on. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, Alan Haynes. 
Alan Haynes was, I loved him, and so did Danny Allen. I mean, I followed him like that, you know, and all this sort of stuff. So he, when the, him and Danny stopped sort of working together, he started a little club in Bateman Street, oh, yeah. up in here, and he called it the Haverjar Club, right? Oh, yeah. And he said it wasn't doing too good, he said so. We were talking one night, he said, so I thought, I'll, I'll put cabaret on in there. So it's just a little drinking club. So, so I came on and did a couple of numbers and all that sort of stuff. He said, nobody understood what was real about it. So they were all young Italians, he said, the waiters. He said, and one night I got there a bit early, and he said, one of them said to me, Mr. Lines, he said, what, tell me something. What goes on upstairs, Dan? He said, oh, you go upstairs and a very old lady comes downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll forgive me using this uh, aid memoir here. That's a word I picked up from Monsieur Eddie Gray. There we are. <laughs> but uh, and I met Danny. Uh, that he came round to see us afterwards after the show. And as I say, he he then said to me, "I'm going to do a show in the West End." He said, "I'd like you to be in it." I said, "Oh, thank you very much." My agent said, did anyone come back? I said, yes, he said, he says he's a female impersonator. I've never seen Danny before. I said, I don't, I don't think he could be very good. He hasn't got a panto. <laughs> 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 but he said, well, who was, it? was his name then? I said, I don't know. I said, uh, he said, wasn't Danny? So I said, yes, it was. He said, it wasn't Danny the Rube, was it? I said, yes, he said, he is bringing a show into the river, a review into the palace in Shaftesbury Avenue. This sounds good to me. You know, so I started, he got me into that particular show, right? And I was with it for two years. Two years. Against the management's best wishes. <laughs> I was getting more than 50 quid a week. I didn't know. Wait to get rid of me, you know. Didn't he insist on your billing? Yes, he did, didn't he? He said, well, I brought this along to show you. I this, is this, 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 this photograph is brilliant. This was Danny. It was the first time I ever had my name outside a theatre in lights. Danny insisted I got my name up outside. <laughs> So in the actual show, you had a 10-minute solo spot. Yes. And then you did sketches. Yes, I did loads of sketches with Dan, and they were terrific. I never forget with the, the opening night, and he have <laughs> been quote, quoted already, but he came on as Miss World, <laughs> <laughs> and I was the compare, you know. And he came on, and he'd never really done done all the drag properly until that opening night he came and he looked bloody marvellous you know? I tell you I fancied him I mean, that sort of thing and he, he was wearing a bikini a bikini and you could not see a lump <laughs> and I did the great line and then he said to the audience I know what you're looking and they were 40 14,000 of them eyes on one spot. <laughs> and that's when he did the great line that became his famous, I've been at it so long, I just whistle and it goes away, you know, on its own. I had my name in the lights, that was... And a wild... Oh, something. A who wild... that show right? Yes, <laughs> huh? He's asking who wrote it. The show yeah. Who wrote it? I, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Clavissa and somebody else. I don't remember if it was her. It was, was of course, bad boobos, you don't know. It was, of course, Barry and Dick Vosper. And there was a there was a Wild West a Wild West scene that, that, that you were in. Oh yes. And uh, Danny was Fanny Oakley. <laughs> Barry wrote that, yes. And I was And you were? I was Wild Bill Hitchcock. <laughs> One night, and the gag they'd written the gag, him and Dick, they'd written this gag, and I used to come up behind Danny with a pistol on and say, Right, stick your hands up, your bum. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we all thought that was quite 
funny. <laughs> but the big laugh was when he added to it. He said, I said, stick your hands up your bum. He just looked at the audience and started to take his rings off. <laughs> And Barry laid claim to that one, I tell you. <laughs> but the, the most amazing thing was there wasn't a single empty seat in that run for two years, I tell you that. And Danny, you know, always, when anyone well-known came, he always invited me out. He'd send Jack down, you know, and he'd say, well, don't you come and have a drink. Uh, he says, he doesn't want you to miss out. I think he just wanted to show off to me. <laughs> and why not? I mean, he'd become an international star. That show really made Danny Lemon. And he behaved on and off just as a sharp star should. And he loved every minute of it. I've never known anyone who loved being a star as much. So did all of his fans of it as well. But I remember just before we the, the season kicked off and I I said to him, I'm a bit worried about it, you know, Dan, I've never played to a gay audience before, you know. He said, only to Barry, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and Dick Wasper, yes, yeah, so they were both at it. That's how they got the job. Anyway, <laughs> he said, I don't play to a gay audience, Dan, he said. I pull in a family audience which was absolutely true. Yeah. He said, I played to a family audience, especially the blue haired brigade, yeah. you know, which was absolutely right. Now Dick and, and Barry wrote the sketches for those things, and the Western sketch was one of my favorites. They had a wonderful line. Lionel Blair was the choreographer, right? And uh, they had a wonderful line. They said, what are you doing next uh, to Danny? And he said, well, I'm doing a new television series with Fanny Craddock, so. and Lionel Blair. <laughs> Butch Casserole and the One Dance Crew. <laughs> Dick Prosper wrote that, who was an absolute darling, he really was. Now, but I've got to just finish by telling you this. This was uh, Danny's funeral, right? Now this was a real Catholic too, you know, all Latin and handbags on fire and all that. <laughs> so, uh, they, they, even, they even had, this is absolutely true, they even had three priests there. And a fourth one, who was, uh, was to do the sermon. A priest called Father Peter Stober, but, and he hadn't arrived. So the service is going on, you see. And Father Christopher Vipers, I've never forgotten the name of Vipers. He said, uh, he explained that Father Peter got caught up in the traffic. So he said, with a sigh, he said, I suppose I'd better have a go then. To do the sermon, you know. And at this point, Father Peter came galloping down the aisle removing his crash helmet and his bicycle. <laughs> Father Wipers watched him with immaculate timing. He cast his eyes upwards, sighed and said to us all, you see, there is a God. <laughs> and I swear I heard Danny's chuckle above all the others that night. Dan was so important for me, he pulled me back from absolute brink, gave me back my confidence and enabled me to still be there doing the time. God bless you, mate. So you, you just said, Roy, that, that Danny and Arthur Askey both gave you uh, a chance. Um, and, and they were in uh, Charlie's Aunt together where the nuts come from for the BBC yeah. in 1969. So did they knew each other well? And do you think they spoke to each other to give you that hand up? Or was it completely separate? I think it was Andrew. <laughs> Arthur's daughter who did the job for me. Yeah. Um, 
and just half of being so nice. You know. I used to go to a lot of funerals. <laughs> <laughs> I always came out with marvellous lines of funerals. You know. And I was sitting there watching the funeral of Val Parnell, and it was at the St Martin's in the Fields, and the place was packed. And Arthur turned to me and he said, You see, give the public what they want. <laughs> I was with him at another funeral, and then you asked, so I used to tag on his every word, he used to come up with great lines. Yeah. And it was at the actor's church, you know, and there's a lot of uh, old geezers and that drinking the old uh, wine and stuff at the back, you know, keeping warm. So just as the service is going to start, this old boy gets up from the back, bottle of VP wine in his hand, you know. <laughs> and he's got an, over, an RAF overcoat on, you know, tied but with a lot washing line around there. And he comes walking down the central and they're just going to start the service. And he suddenly stopped halfway down, turned right and pushed his way past all the people and sitting in the pews watching and they were all dear, oh dear. And all that. It gets to the end, thank goodness. He moves one row back and goes all the way back to the centre. <laughs> Uh, oh, they're all going, oh dear, oh dear, and Arthur said, you see, that's what happens when you get your seats through Keith Proud. <laughs> Stephen, you also worked uh, with Danny at the Palace, but just before that, let's go back. Your father was a master tailor in Soho and made uh, clothes for Kenny Lynch, Jimmy Tarbuck, Frankie Jess Ball. Conrad, yes. Frankie Vaughan, yes. to name just a few. Yes. And in 1968, I won't say how old you were, 1968... Yeah, I was 13. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> After, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the Seville Theatre, which anyone knows what the Seville Theatre is? Yeah. 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 It was where the Del Fox Theatre here. Do you know what it is now? Yeah. The Odeon. The Odeon Cinema, yeah, the Odeon Cinema. And you were utterly mesmerised and captivated yes. by what? Well, my dad used to give me a couple of quid when I used to go up to, to town with him, you know, for the day. And I went to see all the matinees, you know, everything. And I went to see this Queen Passionella and the Sleeping Beauty. And I sat halfway back and I saw this creature come down on a chair that was a butterfly. And I saw witches flying across the stage on wires, on brooms. It was the most fabulous, spectacular thing I've, I've ever seen. And, and that thought stayed in my mind. I went home, talked to mum and dad about it. I watched him on the television, raw variety shows, good old days, all of those sorts of things, you know. And then some years later, I was working as a junior production assistant at Berman's the Costume Years in Orange Street. We did Principal Ladies in Orange Street. And they were looking for wardrobe staff at Palace. So I said to my boss, Noel Howard, I don't know if anyone can remember Noel at Berman's, if I go for an interview, what do you think I, I can do? Will you let me do the matinees, you know, as well? He said, yeah, of course. Anyway, I past the interview, and I joined the show, and my face seemed to fit. Tall and blonde, you can't go wrong, really. <laughs> and uh, it, was the most, it was the most amazing thing. And, and um, I learnt, the quick change tent was on stage right. It was a big calico, rectangular thing, stage right in an alcove. And because I, I'd, I'd always been around hair and wigs and that, because my parents had friends that had a leather and suede shop in Soho, and I used to be there on the mannequins and all that. Who knew? And um, <laughs> I used to titivate the wigs and that, because in those days, Dan didn't have a wig person with him. They were done at Wig Creations, later on Simon Wig Studios, and they would come by taxi on a board with pegs in. And then they would go back the next morning to be redressed and come back again. It was only later years when Richard Morgan lesson came along that Dan had a person with him all the time. It had never happened before. They were backwards and forwards <coughs> to Wig Creations and then Simon Wig Studios in Burlington Street. And that's how the wigs would be done, backwards and forwards in taxis and all that. 
So I learned, I learned witnessing and I learned so much stuff. And my lasting memory there was, remember we had no computers in those days, and the end of Act 1, Dan, Dan walked down this huge staircase. Well, he went up on a hand-cranked riser. It was, it was only three foot square, if that, and, and quite wobbly. And you can see that on the, on the footage if you watch it. And it was hand-cranked. And he would step forward then onto the first step. And seven or eight wardrobe staff would be lined up along the back, pushing the, the huge pink train. Over the top. It was, it was all done by hand, the computers and all that. And that's my, my lasting memory. Um, and then that had to close because of Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> Otherwise, it probably still could have run. So, within five or six months, if that, to, to tap into the box office success, they opened an even bigger, more beautiful show at the Prince of Wales, which I was also on, which was even more beautiful. And then um, uh, 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 my parents were, were in the property and estate agency. I left the business for a while and went to work for them. Then some years later, myself and John Cumberledge, who was a cargel at the London Palladium in the Cargo Fall, we bought the thing when it closed. Lock, stock and barrel. <coughs> Everything that hadn't been smashed up in the alleyway after. And we toured it up and down the length of England. We took it to America once, to Tucson, Arizona, Germany twice, supervising the wigs and the makeup, the London plate and costumes, you know, all that. And Dan was then hired to front a pro-am production in Jersey at the Opera House. And we went along to supervise it. And I rekindled my friendship and relationship with Dan. And then we did one at Leeds and blah, blah, blah. So, so I sort of rekindled my, my friendship and relationship. And we had a few memories. I can't repeat the stories. <laughs> but, um, that's, that's, that's my experience. Of it. But working uh, on those shows, I, I do costumes, I do feather work now, I do wigs, prosthetics, you know. Um, that gave me my benchmark of style, how to do it. That's what I learned from those shows, how to do it. <laughs> And still to this day, if you see anything, any of the costumes that Stephen does, Stephen goes out to Spain a lot and does lots of the carnivals out there, if you see them, they are beyond glamorous and fantastic, like, like no other, like no one else has ever seen before, and, and that comes from... And, and, and a great inspiration, of course, by seeing is Terry Parsons, who designed Danny's Mother Goose, and that, uh, Mark Cantor, who used to do dance for it years ago. Big, spectacular stuff that stayed with me, and, and you know... Uh... So 1979, Danny spent the whole year uh, touring Australia with a show, Danny LaRue, in a glamorous evening of music and laughter. At this time, Annie, you were working making costumes for people like Pan's People and the Black and White Minstrel Show. And just like Roy, you received a call uh, to ring a certain number. And you didn't quite believe it, you thought it was a wind-up. So you <coughs> left it a week and then you rang it. And when you rang it, who answered? Uh, well, it was the um, stage door of the Palladium. And Dan, this was before we went to Australia. Uh, Dan was doing um, Aladdin at the Palladium, and he he'd gone up. He his flat in uh, the next street, just by Foyle's bookshop, um, was quite close. So he'd walk home uh, with Jack, and would get home about oh I don't know twelve twelve thirty one o'clock. Put the television on pour a glass of champagne and Jack would go into the kitchen to do supper. And he happened to put a, 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 a musical program, which I did for the BBC, with um, a singing duo called Captain and Tennille. Oh. Yes, I remember them. <laughs> um, and the lovely uh, Terry Tennille uh, was the lady singer and her husband was the captain and he played the piano. Um, and I made three lovely outfits for her. Anyway, put this, put the television on, and he just called the beginning of the show. And she stood at the top of the staircase in a lovely white dress and coat, and all beaded and sequin work in, in gold and silver and, and feathers. And I did her a, a beaded skull cap as well, and absorbed dry eyes. 
and Dan, but this was Dan telling me the story. He said, I nearly fell off the couch. And he said, so I quickly shouted to Jack, quick, quick, look, look, this is perfect for Australia. We have to find out who made this, and because I want one. <laughs> and, and so, so Dan said, the first job next, tomorrow when we go into the theatre, he said, you, you ring the BBC and find out who has made this outfit. Anyway, so the phone call, Jack made the phone call, and um, the, the lady designer, uh, Linda Wood, who I worked with, um, she was on holiday. So the, the message went through just to the costume department, and another designer friend of mine picked it up, and he was a great, I did a lot of shows with him, but he was a great practical joker, and he played some terrible tricks on me. So he rang and he said, Annie, your hour of fame is about to come. <laughs> and I said, oh, Rupert, what, what, what's, I was always busy because it was my own business and, and I, you know, I, I worked oh, 14 hours a day plus. And so I said, I'm very, very busy, Rupert, what is it? Oh, he said, um, Danny LaRue is after you. Oh, I said, please, go away, go away. <laughs> no, 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 he said, no, this is serious. He said, now take this phone number down. And so I said, oh, so I took the phone number down. And I said, Rupert, I've got to go. Yes, but he said, promise me you'll ring the number. I said, yes, yes, fine, fine. So I looked and I pinned it up on my board in the workroom and did nothing. And I thought, oh no, oh, goodness knows who's at the other end of the phone. <laughs> so about a week and a half went by, and I didn't know that it was the real thing. And Dan had gone to the stage doorman, and he said, there's a lady called Annie Galbraith, and she will be ringing, he said, any minute now, and the call must be put through immediately. Right. So a week and a half went by, and, and I thought, I wonder, and I got curious, so I rang, and a voice, a gentleman at the other end said, stage door palladium, how can I help? And I said, oh, I said, well, um, I've been given this number by the BBC. I said, my name is Annie Galbraith. My goodness, he said, you've taken a long time. <laughs> I said, excuse me. Oh, he said, hold on, I'll put you right through. And he put me through to the dressing room. And Richard Morby, who was um, we were doing dance weeks, he picked the phone up. And he said, oh, hold on, hold on. And he passed me straight to Dan. And his lovely voice said, hello, my dear. <laughs> and I said, oh, my goodness. I said, am I really talking to Danny LaRue? Yes, you are. But he said, I want to know why you've taken so long to read it. <laughs> I said, well, if we meet, he said, Oh no, he said, don't give me the if we meet. He said, when can you come and see me? I said, but, so then he told me what it was. He said, I saw this lovely outfit um, that you did for the BBC television. And he said, I'm about to go to Australia as soon as I finish in Panto. And I want one. I said, pardon? <laughs> so he said, I want, I said, you, you have to be kidding me. So he said, but you made it, didn't you? I said, yes, but I said, why on earth would you want something designed for somebody else and seen on television by thousands of people when I said you can have something totally unique for yourself? <coughs> no, 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 he said, I want one, the bones. <laughs> so I said, all right. I said, well, we'll come and see you. I said, I work with Linda Wood, who is a designer. I said, she's on holiday at the moment. But I said, she'll be back in a couple of days and we'll come and see you. Fine, fine, lovely. Right, I look forward to that. Right, thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> so, you know, came back, I told her, so, all right. So she, out of the wardrobe at BBC, she got the original coat um, that, that we'd made. She said, just to give, give Dan an idea, you know, and off we went. And, um, you know, he obviously looked at it and that, oh yes, yes. But we said, because 
the BBC had a very tight budget, so you couldn't always use the best fabrics. So Linda said, all right, she said, if you, that's what you want, we'll, we'll keep the design, but we'll upmarket the fabric, and we'll do much more elaborate bead and sequin work, and, and the feathers will be much more luxurious. And another little story, I'm sidetracking a little bit, but my feather lady, lovely, lovely lady, Miss Rule in Brewer Street, she said, whenever I have a new client and they want feather boas, she said, I always tell them, I do three qualities, standard, deluxe, and Danny LaRue. <laughs> so we get to the point where I do the fitting, and I'm behind Dan, and because he was taller than me, <laughs> and once I'm behind him, pinning him in, I can't see anything. I peeped out and I said, Dan, is everything all right? We're in front of a huge mirror. And he said, oh yes. I said, but you've gone very, very quiet. He said, I'm mesmerized. <laughs> I said, but you must have had so many fittings. I don't understand it. He said, but they don't usually fit. <laughs> so I said, oh, I said, that's a shame. You didn't know me then. <laughs> so finished the fitting. And then he said, I love it. I love it. I'll have it in black. Oh. And so we said, oh, but, oh, Dan, no, but we can do you something, something different. You know, we're, yes, black, if you like, and we can still do silver and gold beading and sequin work and what have you. No, 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 just, just as it is, but in black. No, fine, fine. And then Linda happened to drop her uh, portfolio and a sketch fell out. And it was one, um, I know Vincent is in the audience, and it's a frock that he knows very well, because when we did the auction at Brick Lane Music Hall, that was the frock that I, I, I gave to him as a gift. Um, and it's a lovely music hall frock, but the one that fell out onto the, the sketch, we had done a, um, a show with Diana Dawes, and I'd made that outfit. And so Dan spotted it and he said, oh, and I have one of those as well. <laughs> and Linda said, no, 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 you can't have that. And he said, what do you mean I can't have that? Well, she said, we've just made that for Diana Dawes. He said, that's all right, she's a great friend. <laughs> so we did a similar thing, um, and, and, uh, but up marketed the fact that lovely, oh, wonderful, wonderful. And then, I mean, I'm, I'm jumping forward a bit, because then Dan went to Australia and then he came back, and it was New Year's, and Diana Dawes was doing a New Year's party for the BBC, and Dan was going to be a guest. And so Linda had had to talk to him, and, and obviously she knew Diana was going to wear the dress that we made for her, and Dan wanted to wear uh, the twin, but next to each other, Diana would have looked like a poor relation. Oh, he said, that's all right, I don't mind, you can make me a new one. <laughs> they, they carried on a, a long, a long association, yes. Professional and, and personal, because he was just, he was just such a wonderful, wonderful man, and it was just, before I met Dan, and, and a little bit before that, 1975, um, there were only two people really left in showbiz that I hadn't made for, that I wanted to make for. One was Shirley Bassey, and I did um, a couple of television series with Shirley, and that was absolutely wonderful. And the other one was Dan. And so, you know, I'd, uh, that was my dream. Dream come true. <laughs> Now, at the age of 78, he played his last pantomime, which was in 2005, in Cinderella at the Ashcroft Theatre in Croydon. There were the odd year that he didn't do pantomime. On the Christmas of 1983, 
Danny did not appear in pantomime because he was at the Prince of Wales Theatre in a production of Hello, Dolly. It started previewing on the 23rd of December, 1983. It opened officially on the 3rd of January, 1984, but sadly closed on April the 21st. Danny was the first male to play Dolly Levi, and he starred opposite Lionel Jeffries and Miss Lorna Dallas. <laughs> Now, let's just take a step back from that, Lorna. When did you first see Danny? <laughs> I saw Dan I came over to London to uh, promote a show called Ambassador. Uh, I came from New York, and uh, we presented the show to West End Management to try to get money for backing for the show. And during the time that I was doing all these auditions for West End Management during the day at Pineapple Studios, dance studio it was called, um, at night, I thought, I must get out and see as much theater as I can. And one night, I looked up and I thought, Palace Theater. So I went to the palace. I sat there and I thought, this is incredible. I was born in the United States in the Bible Belt. And I'm sitting there looking at this show thinking, how the hell do I describe this to people back in the States? <laughs> I, I, it was impossible, but I sat there, I was totally enchanted by it. It was absolutely wonderful, and Danny was so beautiful. And when I got back to the States, I was saying, I've seen this wonderful show. He's not a drag artist, he's not, he is a female, no, but it's wonderful entertainment, you must go. Then when I came over to open in Showboat, a few months later, uh, I had a lot of American friends who came over and they'd come to see Showboat and they said, well, what else should we see? I said, you can go to the palace, see Danny LaRue. And on my opening night in Showboat, I have to say that I had a bouquet of red roses that I could barely get my arms around. It was from Danny and he said, welcome to the West End, may you have a long and happy run. And um, after that, uh, I had met him and I, I was just blown away by the man in, in person. And I would tell all my American friends, well, when you go to see it, I would ring Jack and say, oh, Jack, I have some American friends who are going to be in the show tonight. Could they meet Danny? Of course, Lorna. So they would go to see him afterwards, uh, after seeing the show. And I would dash over after a showboat, race over to see my friends. And of course, I'd hear these gales of laughter coming from the dressing room and go upstairs. And my friends were well and truly, royally entertained by Danny with champagne and everything. And he was absolutely wonderful to all of them. And I, I loved the man dearly. And when he asked for me to be in Dolly with him and play Mrs. Malloy, I didn't hesitate a moment. I wanted to be with Danny. And I knew it was a show that he truly loved and wanted so much to do. And I have to tell you that he was truly wonderful in that show. He had such a belief in it and a true sense of purpose with it. And was very, very believable. And he worked so beautifully with Lionel. They were a beautiful couple on stage. And uh, it, it was thrilling to do that show with him because he was so, in love with Dolly, and he was so believable. And for me, it was a great thrill after seeing him on stage at the palace, and then a few, year, a few years later to do the show with him in, in Dolly. Was it difficult for him that it didn't be a, a big success? Oh, I think Annie will go on with this, that it was heartbreaking for him that, uh, that it didn't run longer because um, He'd so fallen in love with the show and, and with that character. He wanted to do it for so many years. And it was, it was heartbreaking because the critics were not that kind to Danny on the opening. They were looking to see Dan come back as Dan and not as Dolly. And he was Dolly. And that was the great mistake. And the critics were not entirely kind to him. And unfortunately, uh, I remember the, the night before we opened, we had a, uh, for Variety Club, we had a, a performance. And they were not the most giving audience that night. And that was the night before we opened. So it was sort of like, come on, get the bounce up to open. And um, um, yeah, it was tough. It was really tough. But um, it, was, it was a real pity. But 
Danny was wonderful, and he was Dolly. I will never say anything other than that. He was Dolly Levi. The following year, 1984 through to 1987, Alan and Keith Simmons, the Simmons brothers, appeared with Danny in four consecutive uh, productions of Mother Goose, Plymouth, Birmingham, Bath, and Bromley. Certainly did. We're all here tonight because we loved Danny LaRue and still do, actually. He was great. Not only did we do those four pantomimes, we did two national tours with him, and he proposed my brother and I to become members of the Grand Order of Water Rats when he was King Rat in 1987. I mean, it's quite amazing. Uh, he did a great thing while he was King Rat. He didn't get to many lodge meetings because obviously he was very busy all the time. But uh, when he went on the Des O'Connor Tonight chat show, he actually wore the King Rat's collar. And the producers of the show said, we'd rather you didn't wear that, but Danny insisted. And it gave a great bit of publicity to this, this order, you know? And he was doing things like that. And I mean, Danny, you could never top Top Danny, very rarely anyway. I call him Dannyisms. He had some great things he said, and only Danny could think them up actually. We said, we said he never used expletives on stage. He was rather liable to use them off stage. <laughs> there was a party at his flat, and a, an Australian girl was there who'd been invited, but she began to get on Danny's nerves because she was becoming the centre of attraction. <laughs> which he didn't really enjoy, an Australian lady, and suddenly everyone was taking notice of this woman, and Daddy suddenly walked up to her and said, I've got furniture in my flat older than your effing country. <laughs> <laughs> Only Daddy could have thought of that, to be honest. So, so I said it was very difficult to top. I must also tell you, Brian Connolly, who I wrote for for 17 years, and I'm very pleased, rang me a couple of days ago, I'm writing for him again. But he told me, you must tell him this story. He said, when I was eight years old, I went to, my mum and dad took me to see Danny in pantomime. He said, I was eight years old, we sat in the gods, he said, and I was absolutely enamoured with this woman I saw her on stage. And he said, and when we came out of the theatre, I said to my mum and dad, when I grow up, I'm going to marry that woman. <laughs> <laughs> But going back to that first panto, Plymouth, my brother and I, the Simmons brothers, we were working, uh, we were doing summer season in Sandown in the Isle of Wight. Sadly, the theatre doesn't exist anymore. But we were with Bernie Clifton there, and Duncan Weldon, who was producing the pantomime, phoned us and said, can you get down to the press call? This was about in August. He said, the press call at Plymouth for the Danny LaRue pantomime, which we'd been signed for. And I said, I don't think we can get off the island, drive down to Plymouth and get back again in time for the evening show. So Duncan said, can you hire a plane? I'll pay for it. <laughs> so we got a four-seater Cessna, and I'm terrified of flying. I still am, actually, but I have to do it. And it took off from Bembridge Airport on a grass runway and flew us for an hour and a half to Plymouth. And we landed in Plymouth, got away with it, got to the got to the theatre, met Danny, met Jack, who was still with him then, who was a lovely guy. But it was the only time we ever topped Danny LaRue, because when we went into the press call, Danny said, this is my driver, and we said, this is our pilot. <laughs> Talking at stage door, uh, a lady asked you for a picture at stage door. Do you remember? She did. We came out the stage door at Plymouth, and uh, Danny was already there. Unusually, he normally made sure he was the last one out. But he was there, and this lady was taking photographs of him. And she suddenly looked at my brother and I as we came out. She said, "Oh, could I have a photograph of you two? I said, "Oh yeah, certainly." She said, "Only I want to finish up the film." <laughs> <laughs> but he really was an unbelievable character. And on the tour, I remember, we did two major tours with him and travelling him out on a coach for Johnny Manns, actually, who was our agent at the time. Actually, Johnny Manns, the tours he used to work out, I once bought him an atlas of Great Britain so he could see where he was sending us, because it was unbelievable. 
But on one Sunday morning, I remember my brother Alan walked up to Dan, who was on the coast, and he said, Dan, would you like to have a look at the mail on Sunday? And Dan said, am I in it? He said, he said no. He said, no, I won't bother. Dan. <laughs> It's truly a great, a great, great guy, Danny. Uh, Annie, uh, you, you've been quoted as saying that uh, Danny was too generous for his own good. And if he had two sweets, he'd give them both away. Yeah, well, that's exactly, that's yeah. what his mum used to say. Yeah, yeah. I didn't meet his mum. She, she'd already passed away, I think, two years before I met Danny. So. Now, in the late 1960s, Dan uh, gave an interview, and he said that by 1974, he wanted to hang up the frocks and, and, and give it all up. Now, we know that Dan went on for, for much longer than that, and we know that Dan had massive financial difficulties due to, to fraudsters. Do you think that's the reason why he, he carried on? Or did he carry on because he just simply loved it and loved, you know... Yeah, it? no, he did love it. He loved yes, it. yes, yes, absolutely. So, so him saying, he, I will possibly retire in 1974, was... He, he was at his happiest when he was on stage. I, I produced a few charity shows for the Water Rats, and I remember we were doing one at the Ashcroft Croydon. And I phoned Dan and said, Dan, I'd like you to do something you've never ever done before. Would you open the show for me? Just give me 10 minutes in a suit, not, not in, you know, as, as a woman, just do it as a man, just do a few lines, and then give us on Mother Kelly's doorstep, and that'll be it. Get the show off to an amazing start. And he said, of course I will. And he came along, he didn't want expenses or anything, he just came and did it. But he did 20 minutes <laughs> instead of 10. It's very difficult when you're producing a charity show to, to have a go at anyone because they're doing it for nothing. So when he came off stage and uh, David um, Carter was playing piano for him, when he came off stage, Dan, he looked at me and he said, was that okay? I said, Dan, that was brilliant. He said, I did exactly 10 minutes, didn't I? <laughs> I said, no, to be honest, Dan, you did 20. He said, no, I did 10 minutes. And I didn't want to argue with him. I said, well, Dan, you were a bit over, but don't worry about it, you were brilliant. And just at that point, David Carter walked by. And Danny turned to him and said, David, Keith said I only had 10 minutes. Keith says I did 20 minutes. How long did I do? And David Carter said, 10 minutes. <laughs> He was killed by <laughs> But he was brilliant. He was great. <laughs> now, I, I did say that this event would finish around 10 o'clock, but I've still got yeah. about 15 minutes. Are we okay to yeah. keep going? Yeah. yeah? yeah. All right. Yes. We could go until midnight. Yeah, I'm sure. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, during the later years, uh, you said that it was very tough because it was one-nighters. So you're taking all the frocks in and all that. Yes, yes. Very, very busy. Very busy. And, and um, also you, you had sort of really long journeys, um, which we quite often did at night. You're driving? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm <laughs> driving, yes. Yeah. And, and, I mean, one, one incident, um, we... Um, we were in Peterborough, the Key Theatre in Peterborough, and I was very good at finding my way to places, but I didn't didn't always look to see how I was going to get out at night. And we were going to be staying, we were going back to Tunbridge Wells, so where I live, and we, that's where we were going to be staying. And something had happened, I can't remember what it was, something had gone wrong on stage. And so, at the time, we actually packed the car, and we had Jonty then, so that was very important, you know, that Jonty had uh, a couple of duvets that went on the back seat, and, and on top of some of the cases, and then the bed, and then a, a, a blanket, and, you know, a few biscuits, and all sorts, and so Jonty almost touched the roof of <laughs> car. Um, and so I'm trying to find my way out of Peterborough and there are a lot of roundabouts and Dan was whatever had upset him he was just sort of really I, I couldn't tell what it was I just you know I'd say mm, uh, no I wasn't giving much back but he, he was really eager and I, I got to the point where I thought oh, I can't stand so I called over into a lay-by 
And he said, love, why are we stopping? I said, Dan, I said, I'm sorry, but you've got two choices. He said, Jonty, Jonty, can you hear how mummy's talking to me? <laughs> so he said, what are my two choices? I said, either you get out or you shut up. <laughs> oh, he said, Jonty, have you heard what mummy's just said to me? So I said, so? All right, he says, I'll shut up. <laughs> and I said, just until I can get on the road, I said, and then you can start up again. <laughs> you often thought that John T was Jack. Well, 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 yes, because he, he, he was very friendly with Doris Stokes. And he, he went to one of her performances, and she had told him that John T was Jack who had come back to him. Yes, and so he was very, very, very fond of John Who's, who's going to tell the, the jacket story? Oh. I've just got to add this story. Yes, it is. I was there. You yes. Go, yes. You yes. Go. We were in Blackpool doing the um, Pavilion Theatre in the Winter Gardens, and obviously we had John T with us, and we'd, we'd found a lovely pet shop with, with all, sorts of, all sorts of things, and Dan said, we found one of the dresses to look after John T while we nipped out the dress, went to the pet shop, was only a few steps away, and run by two lovely ladies, and of course they adored Dan, and so different things Dan wanted, and then on the, on the wall at the back they had all these lovely dog, doggy coats. And they saw Dan looking and she said, oh, she said, maybe, she said, we have a lady who makes these coats specially, made to measure. And she said, perhaps you'd like to have one made for John T. Oh, he said, oh, yes, he said, oh, that would be nice. He said, his birthday's coming up. That would be lovely. So he said, oh, and he makes all my frocks so she could measure John T. Yeah. So she said, well, no, should it be much better if you could bring John T in? And you would have thought Dan had lost all the money in the world. His face fell. And he said, love, I couldn't possibly do that. So she said, but why not? Well, he said, it wouldn't be a surprise, would it? <laughs> Dad, Mike Doyle, Welsh comedian with an Irish name, yeah. and uh, Dan, you know, it's very hard to be a star, even as great as Dan, when you're on a pier, because you, you walk out, you've got to walk the storm all the way down the pier to the television, <laughs> and they, they were following Chubby Brown, no, sorry, Chubby Brown was coming on after them. Now, the Chubby Brown queue, you can imagine, so Dan and my dog came out of the stage door to face the wind and the rain and had to run the gauntlet of the chubby brown queue. <laughs> this is another age. Shudder when you hear it. And the great Dan is walking down. Ah, there's that poor fool, look at him. And all that went on, all the way down. It was just hideous. Anyway, they get back to the tell and they slump and relax. And somebody said to brought down a drink and said, are you all right, Dan? He said, oh, yes, thank you. The things they were shouting at my doyle. <laughs> I've just thought of a, another show I, I produced at the Broadway Theatre Catford for the Water Rats, and Dan was topping the bill, but I had Craig Douglas on it, Adger Brown, and Paul Daniels and Debbie McGee. It's a really big cast. And Danny was doing his bag call, and he was going through every number, but he was going through all his chat as well in between the songs, and I realised it was going on a bit. So I went up to Danny, I said, Dan, it's a bit over time, about 15 minutes would be fine. He said, no, I've got to do all the patter that I want to do. I said, yeah, but there are, there are other people in the show, Dan. But Dan just said, send them all home. <laughs> Okay, we, 
Any questions for this lovely panel? If we're quick, we've got some questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, didn't any, um, the, the old Madrali sketch um, which is no, marked out. out with Roy Rowland, I think? Did he do it? Yeah. 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 Kitty, yeah, Kitty McShade, yeah. 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 Yeah, Oh, oh really? Yeah. He wore green. Oh, and well, he very black on the side. Yeah. 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 But he did for Kitty McShane. Uh, Usually, if there were any set dressings on stage, oh, and they would be oh, yeah. 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 to take them off. Yeah. 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 Any other question? Mm. Yes. Uh, the gentleman in the, uh, the, the dresser. Yes, Stephen. Uh, you mentioned twice Richard Baldwin. Yes. A bit many years ago, I went to his drag shows in Brighton with a young guy called Richard Baldwin, who became yes. an in the room. Um, a week later. Is he still alive? Yeah, yeah. Si yes, he would have been here tonight. He's been here tonight, but he's really? taking Joseph. Oh. The yeah, he's at the London Palladium tonight. Uh, they've got the check <coughs> rehearsal of uh, Joseph tonight. So. He told us to look out for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you he was dead. I know, I know you were dead. But back to the party. And I think it also has to be said, right. the act took a turn when Richard joined and did the hair and Annie joined and yeah. did the costumes. Yeah. The yeah. act completely took a yeah. much yeah. more elegant yeah. turn yeah. In, in that time because yeah. of Richard and Annie with the visuals. They were just had never been so fabulous before. Yeah. Could I just add something? Uh, uh, several years uh, after Dolly, uh, Danny was asked to do a concert at the Barbican with the LSO. And it was on Noel Coward, uh, uh, Cole Porter and someone else, another composer, Gershwin. Thank you, Annie. And Danny asked me to be on the concert with him. Well, I sweated buckets with about how can I, I can't dress any better than him. You know, that. But I made a, an offhand comment to him. I, thought, I said, gosh, you would look so beautiful in, in white tie and tails. And blow me, he came out in the second half in white tie and tails, and it took your breath away. Yeah. And it also took the breath away of the LSO because they said, oh, oh, yes, okay, fine. But Danny came out, and he was so wonderful with that material, and the orchestra actually stood up and applauded him. And I thought, yes! Yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. And, and, and also in Australia, he asked me to come down and do a concert with him. Uh, we opened the concert hall in Brisbane. And it was televised. Now that could be on YouTube someplace. And there again, it was the same program, and we did it with a large orchestra. And there again, the orchestra was blown away by Danny. And yeah. it was an incredible experience. We had so much fun. And um, there again, he came out with white time tails and smashed it. He really did. Now, just, just to start rounding up, that Annie, not only were you a massive influence on Danny because of uh, the, the frocks that you made, but also in, in later years, Danny came to live with you. Yes. So, yes, so yes. From, from going from someone in the mid 70s, someone that you looked up to and dreamed about making a frock for, to years later, him actually living with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but that was fine, even when we were touring. Um, he had a, a flat in the next street by Fordham's bookshop. He had a house in, a, a, like a bungalow, chalet bungalow, in Southampton, and I had the house in Tunbridge Wells. So the general property we were the nearest to. So that's where we stayed, and various people all over the country would be glad to put us up as well, you know. Now, I've heard, I've heard you say how very lucky you felt that you spent so much time with him. But I think the audience and the panel here would agree how lucky we and Danny was yeah. to have you in his life. Oh, yeah. So, 1968, Danny recorded a song called On Mother Kelly's Doorstep. <laughs> And it reached number 33 in the UK singles chart. <laughs> Danny later adopted it for his theme tune. I thought that we might start ending tonight's show with having a sing-along with Danny. Yeah. Are you up for it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
here to Danny Leroy singing on Mother Kelly's doorstep and please join in. by the British Musical Society. I sincerely hope that you have enjoyed this evening and I thank every single one of you for coming and every single one of our guests. Thank you very much. I also like to give thanks to everyone here at the Water Rats for being so fantastic, to Colin and Alison for running front of house. A very special thank you to Richard Norman for putting all the slides and audio together. John Orchard. John Orchard for helping me plan this. Now, John and I, we're both committee members, and we decided that we'd meet up in Buckinghamshire. It was kind of like halfway between both of our houses. And when we sat down in the foyer of a theatre, we looked up and there was a picture of Danny LaRue. <laughs> And we thought, this is a bit weird, this is a bit odd. And we went over, and it happened that Danny LaRue opened that thing. So it's called the El in in, uh, in uh, Cheshire. So that was very sweet. So thank you very much, John, for all your help. And thank you also for the technician here, Stevie, uh, for the water rats. Yes. Yes. Can, we say, can we say thank you to you, Adam, for hosting this evening? And to... Uh, so thank you Jeffrey for looking after us in the interval, because let's be honest, the alcohol, uh, alcohol flow might fish you. A special thank you also to Jeffrey for dressing the set with these wonderful <laughs> tonight's uh, celebration. Well, I'd like to end it with a, the last, the very last paragraph in Danny's 1987 autobiography, From Drags to Riches. I had a really marvellous life. I started with absolutely nothing. And even with all my losses, I have more than I have ever dreamed possible. This is very little, I, sorry, there is very little that I would ever change. I have loved it all. And I am pleased to say that I did my best, and the public seemed to love me. If I could be remembered for one thing, I would like to think that I was good at making people laugh. Laughter is the greatest thing in the world. And if anyone had told me when I was 21 that I would become an international star by running around the stage in a frock covered in feathers and sequins, I'd have laughed. <laughs> Danny Maru, good night.